Grover's algorithm starts by putting the qubits in the uniform superposition, which I'm going to call psi zero, because it's the state before we do any iterations of our subroutine. And that subroutine consists of applying the oracle to the state followed by applying the Grover diffusion operator. So after we do this one time, the resulting state I'm going to refer to as psi one and so on. If we do this r times, then the resulting state is psi r. And this is all Grover's algorithm consists of. We apply the subroutine some number of times such that the resulting state is close enough to the special state x star that if we make a measurement, we have a reasonably high probability of measuring the system to be in the state x star. And we can always check that we have the right answer by just plugging in what we think the answer is and seeing if the oracle negates the amplitude of that state. So understanding Grover's algorithm is really tantamount to understanding what these two operators O and D do. Now, one interesting thing they do is if you have a vector that can be expressed as a linear combination of S and X star, then after applying these two operators, the resulting vector can still be expressed as a linear combination of S and X star. That is to say, these two operators map vectors from a two-dimensional vector space spanned by S and X star into other vectors also in the same two-dimensional vector space. S and X star form a basis of this subspace, but they're not orthogonal. The inner product of X star with S is one over root two to the N. So I'm gonna define another vector, S double prime, that is orthogonal to X star. Uh, the way we achieve this is just by taking S and subtracting off the X star piece of S. So now the inner product of X star and S double prime is zero. However, S double prime isn't normalized. Its inner product with itself isn't equal to one. So I'm going to define another vector. It's parallel to S double prime, but it's been normalized. So this is S prime. It's equal to one over root two to the N minus one, and then sum over the two then minus one basis vectors, which exclude X star. So S prime and X star span the same space that S and X star do, except these two form an orthonormal basis of the state, which is going to be convenient later on. Now let's look at an arbitrary vector in the space and confirm that when O acts on this vector, it produces another vector in the space, and likewise for D. Let's call this arbitrary vector V, and because it's in the space, we can write it as a linear combination of S prime and X star, let's say with coefficients A and B. When O acts on this vector, it leaves the S prime piece unchanged, and it negates the coefficient on front of the X star piece. And of course, this is still a linear combination of the basis vectors S prime and X star. So O acting on V produces another vector in the space spanned by X star and S prime. Now let's look at the result of D acting on V. Remember D is equal to two times the S projection operator minus the identity operator. So the result of D acting on V is two times the inner product of S and V, that's the coefficient on front of S, minus the original vector V. The inner product between S and V is just some number, as is two. So what we have here is a scalar multiple of the vector S minus the vector V. Now, S and V are both vectors in this subspace. So if we take a linear combination of them, we end up with another vector in this subspace. So the result of applying D to the vector V is another vector in this subspace. So that is just to prove that if we have some vector that's in the subspace spanned by S prime and X star, and we act on it with O, we'll get another vector in the subspace. And if we act on that vector with operator D, we get another vector in the subspace. So if we start out with a vector in the subspace spanned by S prime and X star, then 
after applying both O and D, we're left with another vector that's also in the subspace. The vector we start with, psi zero, the uniform superposition, is in the subspace. So that implies that psi one is also in the subspace because we get psi one by applying O and D to psi zero. But if psi one is in the subspace, then so too is psi two and so on. We can continue inductively. So all of the vectors in this progression are going to live in this two-dimensional subspace. Not only is this subspace two-dimensional, but it's also a vector space over the real numbers. You can go back and rerun the argument I just gave, but this time let V be an arbitrary vector that can be expressed as a linear combination of S prime and X star with real coefficients and then try to show that acting on V with the operator O produces another vector that can be expressed as a linear combination of S prime and X star also with real coefficients. And do the same thing for D. The vector we start with, S can be expressed as a linear combination of S prime and X star with real coefficients. And so that means that all future vectors we produce, psi one, psi two, and so on, can also be expressed as linear combinations of S prime and X star with real coefficients. You may remember that a two-dimensional vector space over the real numbers is isomorphic to the plane. That means that we can visualize these vectors as arrows on this piece of paper. So note what's happened here because this is quite incredible. We started with a two to the n dimensional vector space over the complex numbers. That's the space that our qubits are allowed to occupy. And Grover's algorithm can find our qubits to this limited subspace. It's a two dimensional subspace over the real numbers. And our qubits are only going to occupy this subspace throughout Grover's algorithm. So we went from needing two to the n complex numbers to describe the state of our system to just needing two real numbers to describe the state of the system. So it's really incredible that Grover's algorithm is as powerful as it is, and it comes nowhere close to utilizing the full space that a quantum computation can be carried out in.